Horizon Forbidden West, the highly anticipated sequel to Horizon Zero Dawn, has officially been released, and since I just recently beat the game, I wanted to put together a story explain video for you all. As Forbidden West has this weird tendency to not only withhold information from Aloy and the player, but also just outright lies to them halfway through the game, which may make it a bit difficult to understand the full story. As always, spoiler warning ahead, if you haven't beaten Forbidden West, come back later when you do. With that out of the way, Let's get started. As always with these types of videos, I want to recap the events of the previous game, Horizon Zero Dawn. If for whatever reason you don't need a recap, then you can skip ahead using the chapters in the timeline, or just go to the time on screen to be taken to the explanation of Horizon Forbidden West. So Horizon Zero Dawn takes place in a world with conflicting technologies, a world that has self-functioning machines designed to look like animals, but all the humans in the world wield bows and arrows. That's because Horizon Zero Dawn actually takes place in the year 3020, almost 1,000 years after the world had been destroyed. Life on Earth was much more advanced than we are today. The wealthiest man in the world was Ted Faro, CEO of Faro Automated Solutions, a company that designed robots that acted as bodyguards and personal servitors. He earned a lot of money from this company and expanded his arsenal of robots to ones with military applications. However, in 2064, a glitch occurred in his line of robots. They weren't responding to the chain of command and were acting on their own. A fix for this wasn't as simple as they were all connected to a network together and had zero backdoors people could enter, meaning this not only affected every robot Ted Faro ever built, but there was no way to stop it. Another problem arose, as when the robots ran out of fuel, they would use nearby biomass as a substitute, meaning after time, they would drain the world of all organic resources. This was all irreversible. The extinction of every species on the planet was guaranteed. Ted then reached out to an old colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Sobeck, to tell her the bad news and to ask her to come up with a solution. After days of planning, she and a few high-ranking members in the government came up with three ideas. Project Zero Dawn, Operation Enduring Victory, and the Odyssey. Operation Enduring Victory was a lie spun by the government that was broadcasted to the entire planet, telling the people of the world to take up arms against the feral robots and defeat them before they wipe us out. Everyone who knew of the plan knew this would fail. The operation wasn't to actually destroy the robots, but to buy time so Project Zero Dawn could be created. Project Zero Dawn and the Odyssey were the only two ways the world could be saved. The Odyssey was a colony ship meant to have surviving members live in space as a temporary solution, except that ship's antimatter engine malfunctioned, causing it to explode. This meant that Project Zero Dawn was the only hope, and the person behind that only hope was Gaia. Gaia is a one-of-a-kind AI with nine different functions and was designed to create the Earth when life was lost. I'll spare a lot of the details as most aren't too important, but majority of these functions are things you would expect, like Artemis and Demeter, which was created to reintroduce fauna and floral species back into the world using preserved genetic stock. However, the important ones are Apollo, Hades, Minerva, Hephaestus, and Eleuthia. Apollo was supposed to be the hive mind of all the collective data throughout human history, so our species didn't have to start at square one. This was intended to collaborate with the other function, Eluvia, which was designed to reintroduce human species back into the world via cloning and then raising the humans in places called cradle facilities. However, Ted Faro destroyed Apollo as he claimed it was the poison that killed us in the first place. Minerva was created to deactivate the Pharaoh robots. The deactivation code for these robots wouldn't be created for at least another 100 years, which is long after all humans would be dead. So this was meant for Gaia to use so she could start reintroducing the other functions like Demeter and Artemis that we spoke of. Hephaestus was the function dedicated to the creation of the machines we see in-game. Originally, all of these machines were docile. They were just doing whatever they were designed to, like grazing or terraforming. And finally, Hades was essentially Gaia's reset button. Just in case she made life on Earth worse than before, Hades would activate and eliminate everything she did so she could start over again. One thing to remember is that at least originally, these functions were sort of like buttons Gaia could press. Except 19 years ago, something else happened. A mysterious signal appeared. This somehow affected her functions and turned them into separate AI. So now they were just like the Pharaoh robots, things that used to be under the control of a creator but are now their own entity. The problem, of course, was that these new AI only knew how to do their task, and since Hades' function was to wipe the planet of life, he did what he knew and tried to take control of Gaia. To make matters worse, Hephaestus noticed that humans of the world were killing the machines he made and scrapping them for parts. He saw this as an attack, which is why the machines are now suddenly hostile. In response to this, Gaia overloaded the reactor at her control site to Gaia Prime in an attempt to take Hades with her, but also created a backup plan. She created a human using the cradle facilities with an almost exact copy of Dr. Sobek's DNA, so she could have access to these facilities and be able to view the message that we're seeing on screen. This would then let the person know what happened and how they can stop it. Of course, that person being Aloy. As Aloy was getting older and progressing through her life, a man named Silence, someone who was obsessed with the secrets of the old world, would come across this focus device. After repairing it, he would discover a signal which led him straight to Hades. Hades and Silence would then 
eating meat and they traded knowledge for power. Hades wanted to wipe the world of life as he was designed to, so if that meant giving away some knowledge he had to some old obsessed man, he would do it. This is what led Hades to having a cult back his wishes. They believed they were serving a god, but they were just merely his puppets. I know I'm about to skip quite a bit of the game, but this recap is already long as it is. Eventually, Aloy would then meet with Silence and also come to understand who she is, what happened to the old world, who Hades is, and how to destroy him, which we already talked about. Hades intends to retake the spire located near Meridian and reawaken the robot so he could destroy the world again. But through careful planning and lots of killing, Aloy and the people of Meridian survive and defeat Hades. She activates the Master Override key that she found earlier, which purges the Extinction Protocol and stops the swarm of robots from attacking the world. After this, the credits roll, but not before two cutscenes play out. One is Aloy listening to Dr. Sobek's journal entries and then finding her final resting spot at her own home, which is kind of a touching scene considering that Dr. Sobek is technically her mom. And then the final cutscene is Hades reawakening again, but being dragged into this device held by Silence, claiming that they still have more to discuss. This is the end of Horizon Zero Dawn, which leaves us with a few questions. What is Silence doing with Hades, and what caused that signal 19 years ago? However, with this now finally finished, we can now talk about Horizon Forbidden West. So Forbidden West takes place moments after Zero Dawn finished, as we hear from both Arend and Varl that Aloy just left after the Battle of Hades, which not only makes them annoyed because they wanted their dear friend to join them, but also because the party they hosted was for her, considering she's the savior of Meridian. The reason she left is that there is a new threat coming to Earth. A plague of sorts named the Blight has been killing off plant and animal life all around the world. Furthermore, any land affected by the Blight is inhabitable as we can see Aloy takes damage when walking over it. Aloy now knowing what her true purpose is in life, she realizes she is the only person in the world that can save the Earth. Aloy believes the solution to this problem is Gaia, but since Gaia destroyed herself in the previous game, she needs to find a backup of her. She has been traveling for six months to try and find one, but she has been unsuccessful as Ted Faro deleted all the backups of Gaia. Her last lead is the facility that we go through in the intro. Varl also shows up and accompanies Aloy in this endeavor. This facility ended up belonging to Far Zenith. They're an organization that existed before the fall of humanity, and their ultimate goal was to explore the stars. This is why they built the Odyssey. Originally, it was just going to be a giant space station that was going to transport people to another planet so they could start new life on a new colony, and while this is still the intended function, the extinction sort of accelerated the process. However, they couldn't just build the Odyssey and then take off to a new colony, so they went into a trade agreement with Zero Dawn. They would provide some of their Homer archive, 500 ectogenic chambers, and 5 ectogenesis research reports, but in return, they would receive an alpha build of the Apollo database. It won't be fully complete, but it's an almost complete copy of all the human knowledge in existence. This seemed like a fair trade, except Far Zenith had more malicious intentions. They planned to take Gaia so they could use it on their new colony. The planet they landed on could be inhabitable or extremely dangerous, so by using Gaia, they could shape any planet into a new Earth. But Zero Dawn would never let Gaia leave their hands, so Far Zenith planned to send a spy into the group and have them send a copy of Gaia over to them. It seems that Far Zenith was successful in their attempts to get Gaia from Zero Dawn, except both Elizabeth and another person named Travis, who was the one who created the Hades function, knew something like this would happen. Thus, they created a fake Gaia that didn't even house Gaia or her functions at all. It was also intended to destroy and corrupt Farzina's own data. So Farzina never ended up getting Gaia, but they did, however, still get the Apollo database, as an audio log further in the game shows a conversation between a Tilda and Elizabeth. Tilda tries to explain to her what happened was something she was unaware of and was someone simply acting as a sole party. Furthermore, she goes on to explain that she punished the person who was responsible for this, and then explains that it's not worth holding this grudge between them when the world is at stake. So she reluctantly gave Tilda the copy of Apollo anyway. As we know though, Ted destroyed Apollo, but since this was a copy and one he was possibly unaware of, this would explain why they still have it on the Odyssey. All of this is great and all, but it amounts to nothing, as in Horizon Zero Dawn we find a report that the Odyssey exploded, but this is a lie and something we'll get back to. Aloy, now with no leads and zero backups of Gaia, has to return to the one person she hates the most, Silence. To find Silence, Aloy needs to talk to Spymaster Murad back at Meridian, but when visiting Meridian again, Murad tells her about the glowing light that spurted out of the ball. He is referencing the ending cutscene of Zero Dawn. We already know what happened, but as Aloy climbs the spire, she discovers that Silence intended for Aloy to use his lance so that he could then trap Hades later after the battle was finished. Silence, since the first game, has always been trying to discover the secrets of the old world, so we plan to recapture Hades in this device and then interrogate him for information. Since the spire was activated, it pinged a location 
location for Aloy to follow him, which is in the Forbidden West. The Forbidden West is run by a large savage tribe known as the Tanakh. They aren't important to the overall story, or even really the immediate story right now, so we'll continue past our interaction with them at the embassy. But for context, the Tanakh are made up of three tribes all under one chief, but a rogue version of the Tanakh, just called the Rebels in the game, attempts to usurp the throne and appoint their new leader Regala as the actual chief. Upon arriving to the coordinates given by Silence, we discover that he was successful in interrogating Hades. Silence found that specific forms of data produce different effects in Hades, the most efficient one being a video of bunnies hopping through a field of flowers which seemed to agitate him the most. After 10 days of interrogation, Silence discovered what is actually going on, something we don't even learn until the final minutes of the game. Regardless, this torture was actually killing Hades as it was disintegrating his mind. When we do find Hades, we can see that there really isn't much left of him. He can barely talk, and most of the data he once knew was gone as Silence took it for himself. The only info we can squeeze out of him is that the mysterious signal was sent by someone called the Masters, and when the signal was launched, all the functions who were now AI were scrambling to find a suitable living space so they could continue their operations. Once the conversation is over with, we delete Hades for good and then meet with Silence, who says that the backup of Gaia we are looking for could be inside this nearby facility. It's in here where we can discover that conversation we talked about earlier between Elizabeth and Tilda, as well as Travis talking to Elizabeth about their plans to create the fake Gaia we found earlier. We also discover that Travis found out who the traitor was and was able to get security to take care of him. When we reach the core of the facility, we find some equipment that housed multiple versions of Hades and Gaia. Thankfully, all the Hades versions were destroyed, and even better, we found two backups of Gaia. Sadly though, the backups are pretty much useless as they don't come with any of the subordinate functions installed, but that doesn't mean we still can't find them. Like I said earlier, Hades explained that each of these functions went to specific places, so we can use Gaia to help find the AI, and then we can merge them together, bringing her back to full power, which is exactly what we do later in the game. However, before this happens, as we're about to leave, we hear the loudspeaker deny entry from someone outside, meaning somebody is trying to enter the facility. We discover that these people are not only way more advanced than anyone we've ever seen in the game, but they also have their own clone of Elizabeth Sobek called Beta. These people are Far Zenith. This is where the game tends to go off the rails with its story, as either details are told incorrectly but then corrected later, or are not explained until the end of the game. So for now, I'll be going out of order, but it will make the explanation a lot easier. So yes, these people are from Far Zenith, who will now from this point on be known as Zeniths. See, the Odyssey being blown up is what they wanted us to believe. The Odyssey never blew up, and it was successful in its launch across the galaxy. Far Zenith made it seem like they failed, so that no one bothered to check up on them, allowing the group to be completely isolated. Their journey took them 8.6 light years away to a planet within the Sirius star system. It was during this time that they evolved exponentially. The Zeniths are able to fly, have hand cannons that shoot plasma energy, and are equipped with a shield that makes them impenetrable to damage, at least when it comes to primitive weapons like bows and arrows. However, we learn from Beta that these are the same people who left on the Odyssey. As opposed to Aloy and all the other people on Earth who have the Zero Dawn people as their ancestors, the Zeniths don't. The same ones who left the Earth a thousand years ago when the Earth fell to the Pharaoh robots are the same ones who are still alive today, meaning they are immortal. So while life on Earth was busy playing catch-up, the Zeniths were creating new breakthroughs in all sorts of technologies. But history is bound to repeat itself, and it did just that. While the Zeniths were on their new planet, they attempted to see how far the line in the sand could go. Immortality in the physical realm is great, but what about digitally? Can you live on digitally forever, was the question they asked. This was the next step in their experiments, but it came at a cost. As with anything in life, things are bound to fail, and many of the Zeniths' experiments in this digital immortality failed. The experiment was ultimately deemed a full complete failure, but it was never shut down. They kept all the failed minds they couldn't successfully copy, and because it was just laying dormant without supervision, it was able to gain sentience and break containment. This new amalgamation of failed minds wiped the Zenith homeworld in just a couple of hours. It's unclear how this technology really works, but I believe that these failed copies of the Zenith mind were more active than just data on a screen. It was literally the mind of another person, just not as complete, so it probably had some sort of sentience or consciousness with it. And when all these failed copies discovered that the Zeniths left them to rot in containment, it formed this new being called Nemesis. This is what broke containment and killed off almost all the Zeniths inhabiting the planet. This Nemesis was also the cause of the mysterious signal that destroyed Gaia, causing all the functions to become AI. When the Zeniths discovered that they were dying out, they took to the stars again and came back to Earth, but Nemesis, due to having their minds of their own people, who used to work at Far Zenith and thus living on Earth, figured that's where they were obviously going next. So in anticipation for this, it sent that signal to prevent the Zeniths from living safely on Earth. This explains why we find documents at their base talking about launch trajectories and reports, as they plan to leave Earth and go to some random star in a random galaxy so far away that not even Nemesis could find them. That's why the Zeniths want Gaia, because with her help they could rebuild a new world on a completely different planet. They believe the Earth is finished because the thing they created wants to deny them a safe place to live back on Earth. And obviously it makes sense why the Zeniths would come back to Earth and why Nemesis would attempt to destroy the Earth, because 
because it's their old home. There's no need to discover new planets or find out if it's inhabitable or not when they have a home that they can go back to. Of course, the Xenus more than likely also assumed Zero Dawn worked so they could just then go back to Earth and rebuild. That's why Nemesis sent the signal, but since it didn't work as intended, Nemesis is now coming to Earth to destroy the planet itself. This is why the Xenus needed Gaia, but as we know, many of the facilities here are locked down due to an identiscan feature, so they ended up creating a copy of Elizabeth Sobek named Beta so they could access these forbidden areas. It's never explained how they managed to get a copy of Elizabeth's DNA on the Odyssey, but I assume that they copied it from Zero Dawn when they were infiltrating it to take Gaia. Regardless, this is the full complete story of the Zeniths and how they arrived on Earth, so now that we're caught up, we can go back to the game. Before being attacked by the Zeniths, we found the location of the function Minerva, and when Aloy escapes the Zeniths, she heads in its location in hopes of merging her and Gaia together. After merging the two, Gaia is once again created. Aloy then asks her where the other functions are, and she gets a few answers. Aether, Demeter, and Poseidon are located near by. Functions Apollo, Artemis, and Eleuthia are gone, and Hephaestus is a bit of a weird case which I'll get into in a moment. Remember, Apollo was the archive of all the human data. Artemis reintroduced animal life back on Earth, and Eleuthia was made to create humans again from those genetic stocks they kept away. Gaia explains that they're gone, but it's because the Zeniths have them. She doesn't know this, and it's not figured out until later, but we do know that they do indeed have them, but they don't have a Gaia kernel to merge them with. That kernel is the device we place the AI in when we capture them. This is odd, however, because we saw them take one, but later when we get a distress call from Beta, we see that she locked herself inside the container with the kernel they took earlier. As for the other functions, Aether was made to detoxify the Earth's atmosphere, while Poseidon was made to detoxify the water on Earth, and Demeter introduced floral species back into the Earth as well. With these, we can actually combat most of the problems on Earth, like the blight and the raging windstorms, but only for a few months. We need the final function, Hephaestus, to truly get things back in working order. The reason Hephaestus is so special is that since the signal, he was the only one to actually evolve. He isn't like the other functions who stayed in one location. He has grown his influence across all the cauldrons where he produces the machines, meaning he isn't stuck to one specific place. So that was quite a bit of info, so let me recap the stakes here. Currently, Hades is gone, and Hephaestus isn't captured since he is the hardest to find. Among the other seven, Minerva is held by Gaia, with Aether, Demeter, and Poseidon following later as we progress through the game. While the other three, Artemis, Apollo, and Eleuthia, are under Zenith control, but since they don't have that Gaia kernel we discussed anymore thanks to Beta, they can't really do much with them. Hopefully that makes things a bit easier to understand. So now Aloy sets out to find Aether, Demeter, and Poseidon. These missions aren't too important, with the only relevant detail being that Aloy is successful in finding all three AI and merging them, however, I still want to discuss them a bit. To get Aether, we need to assist the Tanakh, as the chief wants to start the arena up again, but not only is one of the clans within the tribe not sending participants, Regala, the leader of the rebels, also plans to attack during this time. We also discover that the true origin of the Tanakh is based on the Ten, a group of people who they worship, which just happens to be the US Army. After finding Aether, our task would then be to get to Poseidon, except Gaia intercepted a distress signal coming from Eleuthia. As we already talked about though, the distress signal was actually from Beta, who we rescue and bring back to the base, but during this time we find some rebel tribesmen fighting a zenith and they actually manage to kill her. Apparently that weapon was able to break her shield and leave her vulnerable. This is because the one who's been working with them, and not just creating this weapon, but also teaching them how to ride machines, was Silence. He has his own agenda like usual, but we'll discuss that later when it's relevant. Getting back to the AI, we find Poseidon in the ruins of Las Vegas where we meet some performers who have been trying to scavenge the area for these things called embers. Once we get Poseidon, the lights turn back on and we can see what Las Vegas looks like and it's pretty gorgeous. The trio plan to make this a suitable place for people to come for things like food, shelter, and of course entertainment. So they're pretty much remaking Las Vegas out of the ruins of Las Vegas. Fantastic. As for Demeter, its location is guarded by a group called the Quen. They're here because of a belief they call the Legacy, which requires them to research and discover all the ancient tombs and ruins of the Old World. A tier where we meet Alva, a diviner amongst the Quen, who claims that the ancestors left the focus devices to them and them only. Alva is here so that she can find info on how to stop her people from starving and their crops from dying. This means her homeland is being ravaged by the Blight, so now we have a common goal. We then work with her to uncover the secrets of the facility and eventually find Demeter. Aloy then takes Demeter, and Alva takes some of the files back to her homeland so that she can come back with knowledge on how to stop their crisis from getting worse. Once we return, Gaia sets up a plan to capture Hephaestus, which is to contain him in a location with a physical connection to Gaia, and a place that has two data cores, a cauldron called Gemini. She plans to get transplanted into one core, then attract Hephaestus to her location, then trap him in the other core so the two can merge. However, not only will we need to physically carry Gaia to Gemini, the Xenus will be able to detect us once we start the merge, and to prevent us from getting inside, Hephaestus also removed the alpha-level clearance security from it. 
All seems lost, except we remember that Ted Faro has Omega level clearance, which is one above Alpha, meaning we can get inside as long as we have his clearance code. To get this though, we need to find Thebes, his private bunker he stayed in when the world ended. If you recall from Horizon Zero Dawn, the staff didn't just wait for death to take them, they all hid in Elysium, which was a bunker capable of housing a couple thousand people. However, people who were either the creator of the project or were the leaders of the specific functions, like Elizabeth and Travis, didn't make it to Elysium in time, so they went to their own bunker at Gaia Prime. Well, just like them, Ted Faro, being the egotistical man he is, wanted his own unique bunker called Thebes. No one knows where Thebes is, though, except the only people who may have a chance of knowing is the Quen. So we travel even further west to meet Alva and her people. It's here where we're introduced to Overseer Bohai and the leader of the expedition, Seo, whose name is more than likely a misinterpretation of CEO. Seo believes that Ted was the savior of the world and that Elizabeth it was merely his assistant, which couldn't be farther from the truth. Seo shows us where Thebes is located in hopes that we can get him inside. However, Ted programmed the door to only open with his DNA, so Aloy won't even work this time, so we have to sneak in the back way. According to some of the notes, we can uncover that Ted was living here with a few other people, but the most important one of all was Dr. Samtao, who apparently worked with him so he could basically achieve immortality. We can read up on some of the logs and see that according to Dr. Samtao, his cells were replenishing faster than ever before, but he just needed more time for the mutations to settle down. Ted Faro is indeed alive and immortal, but he isn't a human. He's most likely a mutated beast that is just sitting there in pain for life. While we sadly don't get to see what his final form looks like, I think it's a fitting punishment for someone like him. Co sees him and commands his soldiers to burn the place down and to kill Aloy and Alva so there are no witnesses. This causes the reactor to go off and causes the bunker to collapse as well. Aloy then grabs the Omega level clearance and escapes with her and Alva being the only survivors. With everything all set to go, the team heads to Gemini to start the merging process. Hephaestus manages to break free momentarily until Aloy forces him back into the core. We have now hit the last act of the game, and it's during this point that everything seems to be going smoothly until the Zeniths arrive in the middle of the merge. Aloy is knocked down, Varl is killed, and Beta is taken. But before they leave, Tilda activates a sort of flashbang and is able to stun the other two Zeniths while giving her time to rescue Aloy. Before taking the fight to Hephaestus, we end up talking with Beta and we find out that while the Zeniths were putting her to work and basically making her her slave, one of them, that being Tilda, was actually quite nice to her. During her break, she would send her to this private channel of theirs so that they could relax and talk together. It's clear from this that Tilda never liked her people, but what really convinced her to join us was actually Aloy. She had discovered Aloy's focus, the one that she destroyed when talking to Silence around the first time we meet the Zeniths, and upon repairing it, she discovered how powerful Aloy really is. She was amazed at how much she had accomplished in 20 years when Tilda couldn't even do that in a thousand. She now realizes that Far Zenith was wrong, and now she wants to help the people of Earth. This isn't entirely true, as once again Nemesis is coming, and they also plan to leave Earth at some point, so Tilda is partially lying here. She does care about Aloy, and we'll get to that later, but she really doesn't care about the Earth. However, her other plan is a lot more legit, as she plans to take down the other Zeniths. Regala and her rebels, led by Silence, plan to assault the Zenith base here in the Forbidden West. Many of them will die, but Silence doesn't really care, as all he wants to do is use his new weapon to deactivate their shields, kill them, then take the Apollo database for himself. For Silence, a man who is obsessed with old world knowledge, the Apollo database is like heaven to him, which is why he wants it. While Silence attacks the base, we're going to sneak in through a back exit so we can get the jump on the other Zeniths. However, both Silence and Tilda's plan do not sit right with Aloy, so she comes up with her own. Aloy plans to override a Sunwing, grab a canister from inside one of the ancient metal devils, and then drop that on the Regal's army of machines. All of the machines are destroyed, to which Aloy takes the opportunity to challenge Regala to a fight. Aloy wins, and you can ultimately decide her fate here. I decided to keep her, as we're going to need as many people as possible for this upcoming siege. The reason she did this in the first place was so that these people didn't waste their lives fighting an enemy they clearly can't kill. She then gets a message from Silence about what she just did, but she ends up forcing him to come to the base and meet her there. So Erend, Zoe, Tilda, Alva, Kotalo, Silence, and Regala, assuming you let her live, are all at the base together and going over the plan. Tilda will lead them to the back of the entrance of the Zenith base. The group will face overwhelming resistance from the Zenith, so they plan to use Silence's new weapon to take down their shields, all while Beta activates the Fabricator at the base, causing it to create a ton of machines to fight the Spectres that will accompany the Zeniths. While this is happening, Aloy in secret wants Kotalo and Ava to go to the base's regulator and destroy it so they can stop the drones. After which, she wants them to infiltrate the Zenith network so they can find more info on them. More specifically, what Tilda is hiding. 
This part of the plan leads to the discovery we talked about earlier regarding Nemesis and the Zenith homeworld. The group then makes it to the base before being caught by the Zeniths until Silence activates his weapon which lowers their shields leading to them being torn apart by the machines. They all split off trying to defeat the drones while Aloy and Tilda deal with Eric and Gerard, and while it is a tough fight, Aloy defeats Eric and rescues Beta while Tilda takes care of Gerard. This then leads into the conversation about Nemesis with Tilda. She also mentions that one of her biggest regrets was letting Elizabeth stay on Earth to die while she prospered on the Odyssey. So she wants to make it right by having Aloy accompany her on their new planet. Aloy of course refuses, and the two fight. Aloy kills Tilda, marking the end of the Zeniths on Earth. But obviously she isn't done yet. Nemesis is coming to Earth, and we need to find out how to stop it. As the camera pans away from the destroyed base, we reach the end of Horizon Forbidden West. One threat is gone, but another has awoken, so the question is, what now? Well, I think Forbidden West will have a DLC, but probably not about Nemesis. The DLC could end up with the group finding a weapon to possibly fight it, but I can't see a DLC wrapping up this whole story. You might be scratching your head thinking how Aloy and company are going to fight the Nemesis when even the Zeniths couldn't put up a fight, but as Tilda explains, it was the collective mind of all the Zeniths, meaning it knew all the planet's access code, system specs, and other security protocols, so it was able to use that to its advantage. Nemesis won't have that on Earth. It may have have some of the knowledge of the buildings on Earth, so that could be a problem, but it wouldn't wipe everything that fast. While that happens, it seems that the group splits off to spread the word about the impending doom in hopes of recruiting people to their cause. Aloy already has many allies like the Nora and Meridian, but Erend is the leader of the Vanguard, Alva can get the Quen to back her, Kotalo and Chief Akaro can also back her with the three tribes, and Zoe is affiliated with the Utaru. Hell, even Silence was originally going to take the Apollo database and the ship off planet, but decides to go against what he said and stays anyway. They have a lot of people that could rally behind their cause, which could prove troublesome for Nemesis. This leads me to believe that we'll most likely be getting another game in the Horizon franchise dedicated to the fight against Nemesis. And I think after that, will this game finally come to a close with the Horizon franchise finished? I really don't know what they could do past the Nemesis fight. As I said before, a DLC does seem likely, but it's unclear what it will be about. It might just be another group Aloy wants to recruit for the Nemesis fight, or maybe it'll be something else, so who knows. But with Horizon Forbidden West finally finished, we come to the end of the video. Let me know how you liked the video in the comments down below, and also be sure to tell me your thoughts on the story as a whole. I know sci-fi media does get some flack for going a bit too sci-fi in certain parts, and while I do think the Zeniths do stretch that sometimes, overall I didn't mind it. As always, like the video if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you're new. Feel free to share it with someone if you want as well. Of course, thank you to my returning viewers for coming back to another video, and with that, take care everyone. Goodbye.